miigwech. Hanagana. Bojo, Heidi Burns Indigenakaz, Mississauga and Donjaba, Michisagi Territory and Da. Welcome to the second part of this year's Pine Tree Talks webinar series, The Ecology of Minoman. My name is Heidi Burns. I'm your moderator for today's webinar, which I would like to uh, acknowledge opened with that beautiful singing and drumming of the Minoman song by Dorothy Taylor. Today we're joined by three leading Minoman experts from Mich Michisaw Gignishnabeg territory, well, where we will learn all about the biology and genetics of Minoman and the Minoman ecosystem. Michisaw Gignishnabeg territory is covered by Treaty 20 and Williams Treaties. Today's event is following Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario, a time designated in 2016 to encourage us all to take a moment to learn about our treaty territories in which we reside, work, and visit and those territories we call home in order to develop positive treaty relationships. On behalf of Trent University, Chani Wenjak School for Indigenous Studies and Pine Tree Talks organizers, we offer our gratitude to the Michisaw Gignish Nabeg as the first caretakers of this territory for their teachings of the earth, water, and all our relations. May we honor each other, our environment, our treaty relationships, and the teachings we receive together today. Chimi Gwech to all of you for coming together today from across Northern Turtle Island and to our panelists for sharing their knowledge with us from Michisagi territory today. I'm so very fortunate to be introducing our three speakers who have dedicated much of their lives work to ecological restoration and who have greatly influenced my own work and relationship to Minoman. Elder, traditional harvester, author and director of Indigenous Studies PhD program, Gidiga Megaze. Mitchy Sagig Elder, traditional harvester and educator in traditional practices, Jeff Beaver, and program coordinator, instructor for the Trent University and Fleming College Ecolo Ecological Restoration Program, where he researches and monitors aquatic plants in the Kawartha Lakes, Dr. Eric Sager. Chimi to each of you for being with us today to offer your knowledges and experiences with Minoman. We'll now begin our panel discussion and I will ask the panelists a series of questions. Um, so Doug, I'll direct this first question to you. Um, not everyone knows what the Minoman plant looks like. Can you describe what Minoman is and what are the growing stages of Minoman? Well, the Mo Minoman is, uh, has, you know, we, we've been, we live with this plant for a long time. This is a plant that grows in water, uh, shallow water, uh, up oh, down to the depth of maybe four feet. There is a type of rice that grows even deeper, but it uh, generally grows around between uh, two and four feet uh, within bays, quiet bays and so on. It's a plant that comes up. It's a grass, uh, and uh, and it produces a, a seed, uh, which we uh, eventually can store, and will sustain us over the winter time, and therefore very important in this part of the world. Actually, this is about the only place in the world, alone around the Great Lakes region, it grows. So we, we, we are very close to this plant. We cherish this plant. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, very, much, uh, very much part of our ecosystems within this part of Ontario. Thank you, Chad. Um, Eric or Jeff, uh, do you guys want to jump in with anything more? about um, the Minoman plant and what the growing stages of Minoman are? I can probably chime in there a little bit. Um, so rice is a, it's an annual plant. Uh, it grows from a single seed uh, every year, starting to germinate probably as soon as the sun uh, gets strong enough and maybe late April, early May, it'll start germinating on the bottom of the lake. And um, continues to uh, reach towards the surface and by about uh, oh maybe the middle of June you'll see it at the floating leaf stage where there's usually two or three leaves that come up and they'll float on the surface um, 
for probably two or three weeks until the roots get big enough so it's strong enough to put up a spike. And um, this is the, the floating leaf stage. The next stage is the aerial stage. It continues to grow uh, for the next couple of months until about uh, maybe mid-July. You're going to see the, um, the male part of the plant start to uh, emerge. And then you'll see the female part start to come just at the very end. That's where the seeds are. Um, it continues to, to flourish and ripen and other uh, sort of side plants will, uh, will come up and uh, uh, continue to uh, ripen and by about, um, usually by about the first uh, week in September um, in some areas, it's ready to start going in with the canoes and start harvesting the rice. And um, usually by the end of September, it's mostly done and um, the seeds will fall back. The ones that are left will fall back into the water and they'll lay dormant there and waiting for the next, uh, the right conditions to come along in the spring to start uh, start the process all over again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both for your <clears throat> beautiful descriptions of the growing stages. Um, this next question, I am gonna direct to you again, Jeff. Um, You've done a lot of restoration work and receding of monoman. Can you talk about the role of monoman in the ecosystem and the significance of monoman to the food systems in this territory? Yeah, it's uh, it's one of the most important uh, plants that you have in the whole Kawartha Lakes and the whole Great Lakes system is for for you know creating the best habitat for uh, you know lots of different kinds of fish. Um, you're going to see uh, little crayfish in there. You're going to see the water snakes in there. Mm -hmm. You're going to see all sorts of uh, bird life in there. Um, ducks and geese, uh, the the herons, um, they're all in the rice and they're there to uh, to, to feed on those uh, those uh, animals and plants that are there. And uh, so it's really important that um, you know the first uh, probably the first. 10 feet where the water goes down to 10 feet from there into the shoreline. That's probably the most important part of the whole lake as far as life goes. Um, that's where the little fish are and that's where the, uh, the bigger species are going to come in to feed on the smaller species and the rice just, it holds the whole system together. Mm -hmm. um, the muskrat is there, the beaver, mink, otter, they're all in there um, living uh, within the rice. And uh, um, so and you notice a big difference as soon as the rice disappears, um, the animals and the fish and all those little things, they disappear too. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a big benefit to have the rice growing in our lakes. We were very, very lucky to have it. There's, there used to be a lot more, but uh, we still have a fair bit and we're, we're, gonna, we're working to restore that and um, keep the rice growing and um, trying to bring more people on side with, uh, you know, with what we're doing and, and the restoration efforts for, for everything. The health of the lake is important. For sure. I think um, all of us uh, discussing today have, have had the experience of learning about that and watching it happen season by season <clears throat> where some rice beds um, are nice and thick and, and some seasons they're a little thinner and watching those changes year after year, definitely. Um, would anyone else like to add anything to um, that question? Um, I think um, I think one of the fascinating things about uh, the way it grows compared to say some of the other emergent plants, like you know you see the big stands of cattails or even uh, the Phragmites stands, which are slowly popping up, is you don't get those distinct monocultures. It's not the only thing growing. So if you go into those really thick rice beds, Doug the other day was describing you know canoeing across uh, Shimong Lake. Um, feeling kind of fearful of not being able to see over the tops of the beds. But within even those thick stands, there'd be lots of diversity of other plants that are able to grow. So there's lots of these relationships that Jeff talked about between the plants and the animals, but there's also lots of relationships that evolve between the different plants themselves. Um, so lots of diversity is associated. You know, we really, we really do see the resurgence of rice is a good news story with respect to the providing some resiliency to the ecosystem, uh, to everything that's going on around the ecosystem right now. So let, let me add to a little bit here uh, in terms of uh, 
the story of the Michisagi Nishinaabe. And uh, we tend to uh, look at things through what I call uh, through a different eye. Like it's, uh, it's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it's probably a good natural way of looking at things, which I call Nishinaabe science. Uh, but what we do here, when we talk about, say, the different stages and growth of rice, is we have, we tell stories around it, right? Uh, you know, we tell stories of the time that it comes up in the spring and so on, and it brings us uh, warmth in, in, in that time, rather than, I guess, scientifically, what they would say would be, the, the Western scientists would be, the sun is going to shine on the water, and it's going to warm it up, and the seed that has fallen from the previous year's growth, which is an annual plant, so it has to regenerate every year. Um, sometimes it's in a bin, so it'll, you know, that's an aside uh, thing that it'll do. It'll, it'll go for years before it'll get the right conditions to make it grow again. So it has the ability to stay a long time in the mud of the bottom of the bay. But uh, we tell stories more of the rice is the one that helps with the warmth warming of that water, which is the spiritual side of that rice. It has the ability to work with spirit in order for this to happen, right? That's the way, uh, in Anishinaabe science, that's the way they would explain that happening. Because science sometimes fails to understand the spirit of things, right? It's just, and that's probably okay to the Western mind, but to Nishinaabe, we very much give credence to that little bit of minutu uh, adzuin, uh, right? That is the spirit of that plant. Uh, that's why we go out of our way to call it spirit rice, spirit grass. That, that, that's the uh, sorry, translation of it. So it's, uh, it has different stages. Uh, uh, that's the beginning of the work of the spirit. That's when that seed starts to respond, right? To, to all the things around it, including the warm water, uh, which is worn by the spirit of summer coming. Spirit of spring is coming, right? These are all spirits to Nishnaba and this rice has a relationship in there. It's one of the main spirits, actually, at that time of year. It's food for us. It's so important that we give credence to it all the time. You have to, we, I go out there and give tobacco to the, to the, to the rice seed uh, in the spring. I do it again in the floating stage, which is around the end of June, which is the stage of also summer solstice, remember, which again, another spirit is working here. So much of this surrounds that. So, uh, it's minoya imadzuin. It's all of life working together, right? It's, that's where that fits. So it's an important food. It's been with us thousands of years. I think Jeff mentioned somewhere one time when I heard him talk, uh, there's some evidence, archaeological evidence, it was around 3,500 years ago. Well, we even began in our stories giving it credence in one of our migration stories. That is, you know, a migration we think occurred just after the Ice Age. That's a long time ago. Uh, geologically, that's 8,500 years ago, and somewhere from then to now, this happened. And it was food that was given to us to kind of sustain us through a harsh Ontario winter. And this is very important. We didn't have that. Nishnabe may not be here to tell you about it, but we're here. So. To be glad beautiful answers. Um, that sort of uh, segues us into a question I, ha I have for you, Eric. Um, you've been researching and observing aquatic plants in the Kortholix, Michisagi region for nearly three decades. 
Could you tell us um, about the biology and genetic strands of monomen in this region? Um, we don't know from a Western science perspective. Um, I'm sure uh, Jeff and Doug would certainly have um, a lot to say about the different, what I would probably call an ecotype or the different types of rice that we see uh, throughout um, you know, the core of the lakes region and, and Great Lakes watershed for that matter. Um, we sort of see within the Kawartha Lakes, Pigeon Lake, Shemung, the little bald populations, what we would, I think, classify it as the sort of the typical Kawartha strain. Um, but then when you go into some of the other areas, the rice does look different, um, whether that's a distinct genetic uh, population or whether that's a response of the, of the plant to where it's growing. Um, I mean, that's that's something that uh, is yet to be determined. Um, I think um, I think that you know the resurgence of rice uh, on Rice Lake that we've seen within the last five years, and I'll defer to Jeff on this for sure. But when we see the seed from those populations, the it's about twice twice the seed size is what we see um, up on Pigeon Lake. So that would suggest it's you know it's something different from a from a, a genetic uh, ecotype perhaps but i'll um i'll let jeff talk about that specifically as he has the most experience with that that population yeah um, every summer we go from kind of like up northwest of lindsay uh monitoring rice beds right down into the mm -hmm. lanark area so from, from about oh, 10 to 15 years of doing that work, I think there's probably about five different plants. I don't know if they're genetically different or not, but they look different. Um, the Mitchell Lake rice is lighter and smaller with a taller plant than the, uh, the rice that we have at Pigeon Lake. It just looks different. Um, the, the Pigeon Lake rice, the little bald uh, rice is uh, better quality. Um, the Mitchell Lake rice, um, it's uh, for me, it's a uh, it's something that works good with habitat. If you just want to grow some rice to uh, create some habitat, it's good for that. Um, not great as uh, as a table rice because you have to work a lot to get any uh, anything uh, out of it for the uh, for, for to eat. Um, the, the little bald and the uh, pigeon lake rice is better. The Ardock rice, which came from Rice Lake originally, it's it's pretty good too. And there's another one that I've uh, found, uh, the Crow Lake uh, rice. There's, uh, there's almost no uh, rice in it. It's super light, even lighter than the, uh, than the Mitchell Lake rice. It's, uh, there's plant there, and there's a few kernels, but it's so light that it's not even worth harvesting. And there's one other one that I can think of right offhand. Um, it's down on Moira Lake, and this one is a, it's a, it's a shorter plant, and it ripens up, I would say, gee, We've been there on around the 18th of August, and the rice is coming off that early. So it's all different, but, um, you know, to take it to a lab and see whether it's genetically different would be uh, something that needs to be done. Um, so, and then we have our own rice, uh, a nice variety here that came, uh, that started growing here on Rice Lake, I think about maybe, I've seen it about six years ago. And it's a big plant. Um, and like Eric says, the, uh, the grain is, is extra long. That's a beautiful plant. And um, from what we've uh, seen is that the carp are in there uh, trying to root it up, but this plant is so big and strong and got a big root ball on it, that even though the carp are there, they don't seem to be able to root this one out. And uh, it's slowly spreading um, eastward down the lake. So it's gone about uh, a good mile already. You know, we're finding plants that we didn't seed them there, but they're just there now. And uh, so this plant is drifting around quite a bit. And, um, Heading down, we've got a real nice little patch where we are seeding down in around uh, between um, Harris Island or Rainy Island, between there and Sugar Island. That was where uh, there, even when I was growing up, there was a little bit of rice there. So the, the depth is perfect. And um, we put a lot of seed in there this year. So we're hoping that um, that's going to really take off because this is a beautiful plant that we got going here. And it's better than anything I've seen anywhere. So we're, we're working with it. And um, just one further thing. Uh, 
a fellow that's helping me with this race a lot, uh, Bob Pierce, a former Trent student. And uh, he was with John McAndrews when he did the uh, test plots over in the McGregor Bay that found the rice uh, that was uh, this pollen that was down about 3,500 years uh, old. So I'm working back with him again. He lives right here in Roseneath Landing. So, I mean, we go out a lot uh, looking at the rice. He's got a beautiful pontoon boat and we go out and, uh, you know, we check it out probably five times a year. So he's a very big time supporter of the rice work that we're doing. And, and he helps me out a lot. So it's kind of a neat thing to think that the, uh, one of the students at Trent has uh, come right back around full circle and he's back here on the lake and helping with the race. Uh, one of the projects that he was working on when he was a student at Trent back in, I don't know, maybe the 70s, I guess. So pretty neat. The Noman, uh, I think, has that effect on us uh, student researchers. <laughs> um, speaking of which, as a graduate student researcher, I have learned, I've learned a great deal about the depletion of Monoman in, the in this territory. Um, Doug, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the decline of Monoman, of the Monoman beds in Michisagu territory. Um, and of course, we'll open the question up to, to Jeff and Eric as well. Afterwards. Uh, Heidi, can you repeat that? You're breaking up on me here. Sure, I can. Um, as a graduate researcher, I've learned a great deal about the depletion of Monoman in Michisagi territory. I was wondering, Doug, if you could talk a little bit about the decline of the Monoman beds in this territory. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of history, uh, you know, of watching wild rice with our people. And I, spent a lot of time with the older ones who remember some of the earlier stages that I remember, uh, some of the stages of the rest that was occurring in the 1800s uh, was some of the stories that I was told. Now, uh, Shimon Lake, as an example, it got flooded out uh, by dams at Buckhorn uh, and raised the water twice. One of them was around 1844 in order to enhance lumbering and the trend canal systems uh, and so on. Now, the second raising was around 1908. They rose, both times they rose in three feet. So in, in total, there was a six feet rise. The rice took a big hit at that time. Uh, it, it went uh, and it hid. Uh, it it uh, got drowned out, if you want to say it that. I mean, it could it had the capacity to come back, like I said before. Uh, this is why we know that because of that big experience. This is a, a very uh, uh, traumatic time for that part. Mm -hmm. It got uh, it so it went and disappeared, according to the the older ones, but it reappeared again. And it reappeared in those waters that were drowned out. As soon as the, the trees started to disappear and become stumps in the lake, uh, the rice took over and it boomed. Uh, there was a big bloom of, of rice at that time. These are the times that they remember where you couldn't paddle uh, through Chamon Lake. The first, between 1844 and 1908. You could not paddle on Shimong Lake because of the wild rice growing there. Uh, only a little path was, was there. This is what they would tell me. They would describe. They would even describe the birds that were there. You know, when Jeff talks about the uh, dependence of animals on that plant, there was thousands of birds. There was thousands of uh, ducks. Uh, and our people talk about the days when the whooping crane landed on Shimon Lake. Uh, um, so it's, uh, there's, I, I asked the archaeologists, I said, could you not find a, uh, uh, you know, skeletal remains of cranes? And one of them researched it out and came back to me and said, no, we can't find one around Shimon Lake. I said, well, we talk about it. But they said, well, maybe it didn't die here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, they said the nearest crane 
skeleton is just north of Toronto in a marsh there. That's where they found one of them. But uh, I remember even in Champlain's log, which is he passed through Chimon Lake around, around uh, uh, 1615, he described the whooping cranes there. If you read his log, uh, I asked Joel uh, uh, to translate some of the works of, uh, uh, of uh, Champlain for me, just to pick up these little nuances that he described in a documented way. Right? But our people talk about it. This is what I mean that we tell stories around it. And mm -hmm. the crane itself is a very important bird. It's our, one of our main clans in the area. So it's, when you look at Anishinaabe clan culture, it'll, it'll tell you pretty well what was around, uh, what they related to in terms of the animal world and how close they were to it. And one of them was the whooping crane, which they considered to be a leadership clan. You can hear a whooping crane apparently called at the south end of Shimon Lake and be heard at, at the village at the north end of the lake in, in the old days. Right? Uh, they talk about that, that sound that they would make. But the diversity, the thickness went away. It's gone again. And it went, started going into... Uh, it started, to, the race started to disappear almost with the same time that the cottagers come into the lake, uh, which is around the early 50s. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people moved into that, that what I call the uh, very important part of the, of, of the ecosystem, which is 50 feet of the shoreline and 50 feet out. That's where you have all the ecosystems of which Michisagi and Nishinaabe lived on. I've said that before, and uh, but you know we of course just didn't stay there. But that's where most of our activity was, and that was a very diverse, uh, diverse uh, uh, part of our territory in there. In fact, our, when we were signing treaties in the early 1800s, we were telling government, we want the shorelines, we want the rice beds, we want the oak trees, we want the maple trees, we want the river mouths, where the salmon are, we want to keep the islands. Do you think they listen? <laughs> uh, and it's the same story today, isn't it? I mean, surely, why are people building on shorelines? Can they not <clears throat> save some of it? I feel that about Pigeon Lake as an example. Man, that's a beautiful ecosystem. I, I grew up there mm -hmm. on a daily basis. I felt every season, uh, there's a the amount of muskrats on that, on that creek, the amount of ducks, the snakes, the frogs, all that, that was so... Uh, beautiful to see even the plants like eric mentioned about the marshes even the little plant like the duckweed the the medicines that grow there in the, in the, within this space of 50 feet to a 50 feet i call it uh, the uh, sweet flag the calamus root very important to nishnabe all that is dependent upon each other Rice protects that, protects the coolness of the water. Uh, it, it, it was very much also grew on, on rivers and bays and inlets of rivers, and they cooled the water for the fish, right? We don't have that anymore. There's a lot of clear cutting happened in Ontario, believe it or not. Uh, people just don't remember these things. We remember. Uh, we uh, still tell stories. I was told stories about it. I tell stories about it as much as I can. And, and just to kind of go try and see whether we can ever go back to that kind of time. I wish. Me too. Me glad. Um, Jeff or Eric, can I invite you to add anything more? 
to um, Doug Vancer. Well, I could just add that on Race Lake here, it was a big attraction for people from all the whole area here. I know there was people from Curve Lake came down and my relatives from Ardoc, they come all the way up here through the various rivers and lake systems and they camped out here, and harvested rice, and then a month later they'd all head back home again. So, you know, it was a, it was really important for people to gather up enough rice to get them through for the next year, you know. And uh, like Doug said, the muskrat were very pop, very populations were just crazy around uh, anywhere where there's big rice beds, the muskrats move in, they build their houses out of the plants and, um, you know, there must have been thousands of them on, our, on this lake here and uh, when the depth was right, um, I was uh, telling about the, there was one trading post at Hiawatha and they recorded uh, an annual harvest of seven to 10,000 muskrats alone. Uh, not to mention all the other, uh, you know, the marten and the fisher, you know, a lot of animals that uh, were here when the habitat was right. But, you know, as soon as the rice disappeared, well, that was the keystone species for everything. And when that fell through, you know, all the other species, um, they weren't long disappearing too. So, you know, that's just, uh, just an example of, uh, you know, when you start tinkering with nature and monkeying around with water levels and changing the whole uh, landscape, you know, it's just devastating for the, for the fish and wildlife uh, in the area. So, you know, it's uh, difficult to see, um, like Doug said, Pigeon Lake and all the courses everywhere I go, I see new cottages going up every year and they're not cottages anymore, they're mansions. And uh, the first thing they do when they buy a piece of land is um, fire up the bulldozers and smash it all to pieces and harden up the shoreline and fill in the marshes. And, you know, it's... it's um, it's not good. It's going to backfire someday, and these lakes are going to die. I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wish people just leave things alone. I think I think there's a misunderstanding um, uh, of a certain segment of our sort of population in terms of what these Kawartha lakes are, are supposed to look like. You know, there's this in, there's this desire to impose this uh, this this narrative of crystal clear deep water. A hardened shoreline um, on a system which is really a highly productive wetland. And I think uh, I, I get a lot of uh, phone calls regularly about, you know, why is there so much rice uh, in these lakes? And I, my, my simple answer is it's because it can grow there. And the rice will only grow where it can grow. And, um, I think, I remember, I think it was in the 90s, it was shortly after I sort of came onto the scene and the Kawarthas moved up to the Oliver Ecological Center Trent's property on the north end of Pigeon Lake. And I met with Doug and I had a bunch of maps because um, we were starting to see uh, beds of rice returning. Um, and I wanted to know if these were areas which were traditional uh, uh, areas where harvesting happened or where there were beds. He drew a couple circles on a map and we went out and looked and a lot of those, uh, and, and this was before some of the active reseeding was going on. I think Jeff had started some of his reseeding work on, um, it had been over near Gannon's Narrows or in that area. Um, but I don't think it was happening out in the lakes per se yet, maybe. But but I think there was there was certainly a shift in the ecosystem. Probably got a little help from zebra mussels to clear the water. Um, Eurasian milfoil kind of disappeared. Um, but but because of all that development in the watershed, I think the lakes probably got a little shallower, and so that created conditions where the rice could start to grow again. And uh, and it really started to grow. I, I don't think it's anything like it once was, but. It, I have to say that it, it was one of those those things where you kind of you get a little a hope you know um, you feel good about something in the ecosystem again and it's amazing um, it's amazing the power that a plant can give not only to the to the ecosystem but to the people as well um, and I think I think that narrative of rice being a good news story. Um, is, is a narrative that that I I find uh, um, 
I find difficult to believe that not everybody can just accept it, you know, that there is actually, uh, you know, it gets equated to be, you know, much like many of our other quote unquote invasive species. But, and I think part of that, maybe that's a misunderstanding, part of that's, you know, being caught up in, in the sort of that cottage narrative that we want to create for the coworkers. But I think there's an opportunity to listen to what the plant's saying. Um, you know, the plant's not growing where it used to grow because it can't grow there. Um, and the, the areas where it's growing now, you'll often hear stories, well, this used to be a farmer's field. Well, it's not a farmer's field now, um, but it's providing some pretty good uh, habitat for rice to grow and then for all these other components of the ecosystem to start to come back. And I think we have to embrace that and encourage it. You know, Doug put out the charge the other day that we really need to think about rewilding things again. And I agree with that. Um, that's going to give that's going to give our ecosystems the resiliency they need to deal with the myriad of other things we're throwing at it right now. Um, and I think we have to listen to this this plant. Mm -hmm. I agree. Miigwech for, for your answers. Um, Jeff is a traditional harvester and educator. Can you share a little about harvesting of monomen and the recultivation of monomen? Um, you did touch a little bit earlier on about the recultivation, um, but maybe we could expand a little bit about what harvesting and recultivation of monomen uh, looks like. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, like I said before, we go out uh, and we try to look at all the beds and um, try and figure out, uh, you know, which is the best bed to send and start sending people to. Like, there's uh, probably about 10 or 15 that we check every year. And out of the 10 or 15, there might only be three or four that are kind of worth going to. So um, as the rising season uh, comes along, people start phoning or I put in the newsletter that, you know, these three lakes are probably the best places to go. And um, people just, um, you know, load up the canoes when it's uh, they think it's ready, right in around Labor Day weekend, and and that's where they go. And uh, this year was a pretty tough year, where it was only a, a couple of places really that were much good. Um, there wasn't a lot of rice uh, that I found anywhere um, that was, uh, you know, like not like Pigeon Lake usually is pretty good, but it wasn't that good this year. Um, so we, we didn't go there, but we went to Ardock. It was it was I would say medium there, and some people went there. Um, Rice Lake was pretty good this year, and um, we did go over to uh, Mitchell Lake with, uh, with Doug's class, and we got some rice there. Um, so basically, the harvest—you uh, know—you have a paddler in the front of the boat, and they're they're searching around, looking through the the rice beds to find the thickest and the ripest uh, um, batch of plants, and they'll they'll paddle carefully paddle you through there so they don't knock the rice off before the person in the back with two. Um, light cedar sticks about maybe 33 inches long they'll fold those um, they'll fold those uh, plants over the edge of the boat and just give it a light tap with the other stick and anything that's ripe on there uh, will fall off into the bottom of the canoe and um, then in two or three days you can go back through the same area again the, the plant ripens from the top down mm -hmm. so in maybe three days it'll ripen up again you can kind of go back through your same channel again and you can harvest it again if you're if you have a chance to go back a second time so um, that's basically what we probably do that, um, you know, if I would say if you get 10 days, two weeks of harvesting, that's probably about the limit. Um, usually a thunderstorm or a big wind will come in and they'll, they'll, uh, the plants will start moving around and it doesn't take much to dislodge that ripe uh, rice. The, the seeds are nice and big and heavy and, and any little movement, it'll, uh, that uh, seed will fall off back into the water again. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, that's what we do. And um, from there, I just usually put it back into the water again. And uh, we put it in bags. I put it back into the water again for maybe four or five days. It helps uh, ripen the plant up. And um, there's a little uh, there's a little rice worm in there. If you don't uh, do that, they'll just continue to eat the rice right in the bag. So I usually sink it underneath the uh, underwater for about four or five days and then bring it out. And um, all the little critters in there are, are done for. And I just spread it on tarps and... Uh, in three, four nice warm days that we might get in around the end of September, early October, you can just um, bag it up again and uh, wait for some other, another nice batch of weather, maybe in around Thanksgiving, 
and um, you can start doing the the, uh, the parching, which is uh, putting it into a kettle and roasting it up uh, under a little light fire. Um, kind of gives it a nice nutty flavor and browns up the outside of the kernel, loosens up that kernel. It really dries the rice right out. So like Doug said, you can keep it forever if you keep it dry and uh, in jars or whatever. It will mm -hmm. keep forever. So um, uh, then we... Um, We'll dance it with the, with a pair of moccasins on, so you don't crush the rice. If you wear hard boots, you're going to crush it. And um, in the next step is uh, you're going to sift it off in the wind. So the, the light uh, ground up chaff is going to come off of those hard kernels, and uh, the wind will just blow it away, and your, your nice hard heavy kernels will fall back into another kettle or onto a, a tarp or a blanket. And then uh, the final cleaning, you're just sitting down at a table with a couple of pie plates and pouring some out onto the pie plate and separating the, uh, that's the most time consuming part of it really and the most tedious part of it is just separating the, uh, you know, those, uh, those kernels that didn't, uh, uh, didn't dance off or winnow off for you. And you got to pick that out of there and then it's ready to, it's ready to cook after that. So, you know, that's what kind of what we were just, we're just kind of doing some of that work now. It's, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. Sit around in the evening and clean up the rest of the rice and put it in jars and and we'll use it over the winter for whatever whatever way we want um, rice pudding or the soups and stews and all that. So, yeah. Um, there was a question that came in from the first part of the webinar series, and it seems pertinent to ask here. Um, and that question I posed to each of you. Um, should Monoman be promoted as a sustainable local food? Um, maybe we could begin with um, you, Doug. Okay, miigwech. Uh, the short answer would be yes. Right? I wish that somehow or another these indigenous plants would be nurtured, uh, would be whatever we have to do, keep it around as long as we can. Because I think there's a relationship between that and the very existence and, and, and uh, survival of man. Um, I can see in my older age uh, that uh, we're in trouble in a lot of ways. The, uh, the Western style of living is not sustainable. I think they know that, but they can't do anything about it to stop it. There's a lot of good people out there. We're going to have to depend on these good people to kind of promote this. And there's a, we have a lot of allies now. We have, we're strong in that way. We're coming uh, people are working at it like I've never seen before. I remember in the days of, say, in the 1950s and 60s, when the rice was disappearing, it was backing up, <clears throat> and there was nobody around to help, right? So it's uh, it was a very disappointing time. But from that time to now, it's so different, thanks to whomever started this and i thank some people last uh, in my last talk and i there's a reason for that is because i really want to encourage people like yourselves to uh, to work at it too and i know uh, each of you in your own way uh, know what i'm talking about and i think most people know know what i'm talking about but sometimes we just are so taken up by the modern way of doing things in the modern context that we forget that we're a basic soul we're a basic spirit uh we can't we can't be fooling around much longer i mean it's just it's the point we're at a point of no return and this is why i was saying the other day about and eric mentioned it about rewilding it's uh it's a concept it's an idea that animals need you know we're thousands of animals are disappearing every day in terms of a species they get birds are just pathetically low uh, 
and some of the other birds are doing amazingly well, which are the ones who are uh, what we call the earth cleaners, like the crow and the seagull. They're doing amazing because you just dump all over the place good food. Uh, and they're just coming along and picking it up. They're doing good. But the birds, like the Oreo, the, the flycatchers, the warblers, uh, uh, the ones who bring summer to us, uh, you know, what's going to happen if they disappear? Neben is not no longer is going to come up here. We'll have another big freeze, and we'll have repeat history. We should be learning from. So it's yes, rice is part of this whole process of survival, and I think it's important that we keep it. Good question, Dr. Eric. Would you like to contribute to this question? Should Monoman be promoted as a sustainable local food? I'll defer to Jeff for now. <laughs> yeah, I think for sure it's got to be a promoted as a sustainable food. I mean, um, I think it's basically proven itself over the last uh, many, many thousands of years that, uh, you know, it's something that certainly is a sustainable food. And I think, um, you know, with what we're going through now, it's just a little, uh, a little warning sign when you start seeing, uh, you know, the store shelves being emptied out and, uh, and it happened so fast that, uh, you know, you don't know what's coming in the future here. So, um, you know, it's, it's important to certainly don't destroy it. You should be trying to promote it. You may need it in the near future, just the way things are going in, in this world, you know. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me to, um, you know, go out and, um, and and try and destroy something that could sustain you in the next little while. You know, like um, a lot of stuff is going fast, and uh, this is just a little scare we're getting right now. I think for the, what's coming in the future. So, you know, not only the Indian will need the rice, but I think maybe some other, a lot of other people might need it too. Like we don't know what, what this future is going to hold. It's not getting any better. I can tell you that. You know, it's uh, the way things are going. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly it's a sustainable uh, food. It's been around for forever, and it it, uh, it can be grown in lots of different places uh, if, you, if you just give it a chance. And that's the big thing. Uh, people are, are not willing to give it a chance in some places. So uh, that's my thought on it anyway. And Doug's covered a lot of it already. But, uh, yeah, you know, we've got to work hard to keep this plant around along with all the other ones too that uh, have disappeared uh, you know that list the species at risk list it's not going down it's getting bigger every year so you know we gotta we gotta protect the habitat that's out there because there's not much left especially here in southern ontario it's just getting it's awful mm -hmm. go ahead eric i was gonna say i think that's the real value of rice is it brings a lot of friends um and so you know not only are we nurturing a sustainable food but we're also nurturing a, a, a sustainable ecosystem and, and we have a responsibility um, to do better um, in a very short amount of time um, we've had drastic impacts on uh, on ecosystems uh, we have to rethink our approach uh, in terms of how we are going to interact with uh, these natural ecosystems in the future it's 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 not it's not something that's there just to serve us we have a responsibility to work with and to nurture and what better teacher than you know right now the rice that's uh, that's doing its job for us at, you know right now so let's let's listen to what it's saying absolutely um miigwech uh, there's a lot for all of us to think about. And I really appreciate your conversation and um, teachings uh, that you've shared with us today. Um, yeah, Jimmy, congrats yeah. to you too, uh, Heidi. Yes. You know, I could go up, men, bump, be. Jimmy, congrats, Heidi. Jimmy, congrats.
It's been lovely talking with you. Uh, we've worked our way through all of the questions uh, that we had for today. Um, can't say to miigwech enough. Um, we're so fortunate to be able to offer viewers the uh, premiere screening of a short video with Gidiga Megaze and Jeff Beaver. Um, that was put together by jo Josh Felton, Professor of Environmental and Natural Resource Sciences at Fleming College. Um, he spent some time with Gidiga Megaze and Jeff Beaver over the summer talking about Minoman. Um, and he's prepared uh, some of these, uh, he's prepared this video of elder teachings, uh, which we're so excited to share with you all now as we bring the webinar to a close. Um, and we'll be following that short video with Dorothy Taylor's performance of the Minoman song. So please stick around for that. And be sure to tune in on December 1st at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for part three of this webinar series where we'll hear from very special guests, Janice, Janice McHugh, Autumn Watson, and Damon Weetung, who will teach us all about putting Minoman on your table. May we honor our, the Minoman, each other, our teachings, and our treaty relationships always. Miigwech to you all. I'll, I'll tell you the, the story in the language. Anin, then, we debauch metonim, meosh anishnabe, Magi Bishama, Chisagi Gini, Kipi Shaggy Uema, Piga Squa Scouting, Chim Scouting, Ogipi Tuna Watashua, Can a Nishnabe in Minwama, Can a Nishnabe Odzu in Ma, Mitashkan in Dwawide. Bishne manik kerwi bishayik ki ki keto o nana bush midashio kanad no nishna ben miyajiji bishayi weik midash gum kana o wete yo amenomen wete kido gushneik wete sena kchegaming miyajik can make wete ka. Ya tato nishna be me osha mi oge ma chiking ma neping dasha mi dasho de anta ega kiketo wa kena ge me ne tok pane ko mi ko chinde na 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 mi wete ya chimi ko chiko kena me me ge gino angi na na mi ko chime no ga ke ni pen ge o shawen kipi to wat ne sagana das che mena yagma misaga je chenen mong das nogum mi ko das ka kos ne ka ne nishna ba man ne menu men ko is ne ka ta ne pipa ne o ga mi ko et o o ke che man ne to kena e mo ka che ma chi king e Oh, miigwech. During the time that we left our home, which is a Great Lakes area, um, because of glaciation, uh, we returned to the mouth of the Great River. And uh, we had to stay away because of the cold and the building of ice that was formed by Bitbone, which is the spirit of winter. Uh, remember, our seasons are spirits. And they uh, worked uh, at these things. That's their role. Now, uh, Nana Bojo and Bitbone had an argument and had a fight over who was the strongest. And Bitbone showed Nana Bush that uh, she was the strongest by uh, by freezing all this land, Nishnabe's land. So uh, Nana Bush lost that fight, so we had to leave here. And we were after Nana Bush for thousands of years to fix this problem. 
And, but we ended up uh, actually along the coast below the mouth of the Great River. And then one day Nana Bush says, well, I'm going to go and ask Nibin, which is the spirit of summer, and Shawin, which is the spirit of the south, to, uh, to come here and warm it up, see if they could do it and melt the ice. So they did. And so uh, as, uh, quickly, uh, the uh, summer uh, took over a certain part of the year. So then Nishnave was able to come back uh, uh, to this Great Lakes. Now the instruction given was that they would come and they would migrate up the Great River and when they got to their home, they would find the grass growing on the water, which is going to feed them. It'll be food and, and, and become a staple. And this is the plant we call menomen. And because of that connection, we also changed some of the name a little bit to manomen, which is the, the uh, menomen means uh, good plant, while manomen t wants to mean the, the spirit rice. So uh, uh, we have cherished this, this for a long time. And now we're talking about uh, probably uh, anywhere in terms of modern way of do, doing time or telling time would be three to 5,000 years ago. Because uh, the last glaciation to leave this area, we're told, was around 8,500 years ago. So the story goes that we, we will find this plant and this special plant growing here and it fits the modern understanding of, uh, you know, wild rice and where it came from. And this is where they did a, a study. Uh, um, Trent University went back in here and they did some cores uh, with, a, with a sampler down through the mud. Yes. And they found the uh, rice was back in here uh, about 3,500 years ago. They found pollen, like big layers of thick rice pollen way back in there. So this map here, it says, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right date on it, but it's somebody wrote in 1935 on there. But I'm not sure if that is the right date or not. But anyway, everything that's shaded in here at, uh, when this map was made is, uh, is wild rice. And we did an uh, approximate area of what is here, what was here, when this map would be 2,500 acres anyway. This is what was here. And uh, so you can see there's a big bed, stretches almost from uh, Hiawatha and goes right down. And at one time it all joined up right down past Foley Island. Uh, it was about 11 miles one way. So, you know, by the time you gather rice all through there, you would have an awful smash of rice. Huge beds, thousands of acres, really, if this, you know, once the water levels would have been back to where they were before the dam went in, you know, there would have been rice all the way right from here, all the way down right into the Trent River. The whole thing was rice. But as the water levels come up, the rice beds shrunk back into sheltered areas, you know, in behind the islands. And, and my aunt actually remembered harvesting rice so right in here with an old fellow from Alderville in around probably 1932 or 33 in around there. And uh, another old timer that uh, is still alive in his 90s, he remembers harvesting rice all around Sugar Island out in here like this. And he said they'd fill the canoe in the morning and they'd fill it again in the afternoon, him and his father. The importance of wild rice is that, remember the lifestyle of Nishnabe is such that, you know, we have to face the winter. Canadian winter is pretty harsh environment for people who live on the land. So you needed something to sustain you from, from the fall to the spring during that period of winter and you had to store some food. And the only one at that time that could be stored is the wild rice. That's the plant of the first stored food 
for us, right? Stored food is, was important. And so there's a couple of things that Anishinaabe did. One of them was to keep wild rice. It keeps good. If you dry wild rice in the proper way, it'll keep forever, right? Once it's in that black state, dried, cured, it'll stay forever. So you can have it all winter and it will sustain you. It's a food that you can almost live by itself for a couple of months. And that's what really what you need. The whole thing is a relationship of all that phenomena of survival of the winter. Right? That's where wild rice, I think, became really important to the nation. And it's, that's why I think it's important that, that the spirit world and realizing that had, had to create a certain plan for survival of that winter. It could be translated to mean that it has the ability to, to sustain the body over the winter of all the plants in the best way. Yeah. Well, there's people from Hiawatha harvesting Alderville and others from Ardoch and we have other people have come through and so they came all the way from uh, Rama First Nation, hmm. all the way to Rice Lake. Thousands and thousands of acres and I suppose they had a, you know, they met their friends and relatives and uh, everybody would kind of, you know, gather here probably about mid-August till maybe the end of September. Everybody come here, it was, a, it was a gathering place for a lot of different people from hundreds of miles away, they would come here. To Anishinaabe, everything is connected, right? I mean, you hear that all the time, but it's so true in terms of the stories that we tell uh, that all animals that live around the water and along the lake shore uh, and the water's edge and so on, uh, you can see where they survive on that plant. And and other things like that appear to not survive on that plant, like uh, uh, like, like turtles and, and, and frogs and and uh, snakes, that kind of uh, animal. I think we overlook the fact that they use this as shelter. That's the way we look at things. There's a relationship there. Wild rice, I can see, you can see by spending a lot of time in it, all those big beds that used to be, that there's a lot of animals that depend on it from the smallest little spider to the biggest goose and biggest musky love, love wild rice uh, to live in it. Bass, of course, live right in it. Uh, during the month when it's hot weather of August, uh, the fish live under those beds of wild rice that float up. And wild rice has this knack of leaving the, the bottom and floating up on mass and laying there. Um, we think actually that, that something has happened to the wild rice. Um, that's what the old ones used to say, that would make it do that, that it would leave the bottom and float. The fish loved it, they, they lived under there. So, I mean, it just, shows how we follow the the animals and how they adapt to the to the plants uh, like the wild rice on the water the uh, the muskrat as an example feeds on it quite heavily they build their houses with uh, wild rice and uh, they actually i think promote a lot of uh, uh, regeneration of the rice by, by eating the stalk, cutting it off when the seeds are mature and it falls in and those seeds get away from the geese. If the muskrat doesn't beat the geese, the geese will beat the muskrat, right? I call that the competition between the goose and the muskrat. And uh, that balance has been something uh, between them 
that have worked over many years, probably ever since the creation of, uh, or of the wild rice. We understand and we recognize the importance of plants, in very much the wild rice, for the survival of the kind of animals that live here. Of course, we in turn as human beings live off these animals. Charles Fothiger was a naturalist from Port Hope, and he would go out to, um, he had a cottage out around uh, the mouth of the autonomy there somewhere, and it talks about, um, he uh, he bought two white muskrats, and he bought a couple black ones, mm -hmm. and it says there, there about 10,000 annually upon the rice lake. And this yeah. one talks about um, all the fish that were in rice lake, they had a big feast over there. Mm -hmm. um, black bass, this is an interesting one. American eel, mm -hmm. in, innumerable and delicious. That's how you live on the land, is to get a relationship going uh, and develop this relationship in order to survive with each other, right? The animal world, we believe, can survive here on Earth on its own without us. We have to give homage to them, we have to pray to them, and we have to give tobacco, and we have to know the importance of them within that system. That's what I ask of the children, and that's what we sh should live by. And, and it started to drag him all over this lake, believe it or not. Uh, imagine picturing Macomas going by here and his dugout canoe being pulled by a muskie all the way up the lake. I like to look for this bed back here. It's going to be perfect for the students to come up here and, uh, mm -hmm. and do some racing. Nice.
Kanakana, Mikwach. Kanakana.